All right, welcome. So in this video, I want to show you how we can capture mouse input and mouse events so that we can use mouse input in our game as I've got in my simple demo here. Now for my game, I actually only needed to capture two different kinds of input, which was the click. Uh, as I click, we will place stones on the board. Uh, but the other one that I use is called the mouse move event, which is used to create that the shadow of the stone above the board, showing where the stone would be placed if a click was made. Now, when I capture mouse events, like I'm doing in these two cases here, when I listen to them, usually what I want out of the event is the XY coordinate of that particular mouse event. Now, usually we're listening for clicks and a click is pretty straightforward. Uh, context will get you the right click and of course you can listen to for double clicks and so on. Uh, the mouse move is just going to be listening for whenever the mouse moves. And so I'm going to use this event to know whenever the mouse cursor moves so I can draw a little shadow of a stone next to that cursor. So these are the two events that I want. Now when, when both of them uh, occur, what I actually want to do, and this is a similar design pattern to what we did in the last video, I'm going to create a local property or field for my game engine that's going to record this particular input event. And I'm going to give them names that I can easily remember. So click is going to be recording my click event and mouse is going to record my mouse move event. Now in the keyboard events, we tended to just record whether the keyboard event was happening or not, so true or false. But with mouse events, usually we want more. We want more information. So one thing we could do is we could just store this E, remember this event that is fired off by the browser whenever the keyboard is pressed or the mouse is clicked and so on. This event is the event that we can capture and look at different information about. For instance, things like is this a control click or a shift click and so on. We could go and check those information in this E. Sometimes we might want to just keep that E and we could just store that E in the click itself as this local variable. And then that way, any entities that need to check to see, hey, are you clicking on me? Is this click for me? Can check that local variable and say, hey, what are the variable details that might be relevant to me? Now, for most of my games and for most of what I'm interested in, the, the parts of the event E uh, are mostly just superfluous. I don't need them. Uh, all I usually need are the X and the Y. And so that's why I've got this little helper function here. And you can see it's, it's just up above there. This little helper function is going to fetch the X and Y or strip the X and Y, if you like, out of the event and store it in the click. Now, it's got two parts and I want to go over both parts because uh, for your particular game, if you want to be capturing a click in your game, you probably want to also uh, strip out the X and Y or at least modify the X and Y ever so slightly because as you can see here my first two lines what I'm going to do is calculate the X and Y relative to where on the canvas we're clicking. Now the reason for that is the click itself is recorded by the browser and it is recorded in a couple of different ways. It is recorded where on the screen you have clicked. Usually that's not very relevant. Where in the window you have clicked that's a little bit more relevant, but then it's also where maybe in the client area you have clicked and the client area is the part of the window where the, where the web page is actually visible. Okay. The rest of the browser is not really worried. We're not worried about clicking on the rest of the browser. The browser is worried about that. That's you clicking on, you know, different buttons and so on that, that change the performance of the browser inside the client area. You're clicking, clicking on the web page and the web page is going to respond to that. And that's what we want to respond to. So when we go into the event, we're going to fetch the client X and the client Y. That's going to tell us where inside the, the web, the space of the browser that is dedicated to the web page, we're going to, we're going to click. So that's going to normalize it to zero, zero being the top left corner of the web page. Now, our canvas is not usually nudged right up into that top corner. So we actually want to know the X and Y relative to the canvas. And so to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab the canvas, which I have a reference to here, and I'm going to use this to fetch the bounding rectangle of this canvas. And then, you know, we can jump onto the Mozilla Developer Network and we can go check out 
the API here and see what this actually fetches for us. But we can, you know, if we do that, we can double check. That's going to give us a left and a top. And that's going to give us the left boundary and the top boundary. And so I'm going to subtract those off from my client X and Y. And that's going to renormalize our coordinates to the coordinates relative to the canvas now. Now, for your purposes, this might be enough for you. This might be all you need. But for my game board, my game board has a border on it. And on that border, um, nothing is going to be played. No stones can be played. And so I've got another offset here because my pur the purpose of my get X and Y here is not just to do up to this point and strip the X and Y relative to the canvas, which again is maybe the purpose that you might need, but I want my X and Y to be on the game board, relative to the game board. And in the game of Go, there are 19 squares, 19 by 19, I should say, and I want to know which one of those squares I'm in. That's all I want to know. And so I want to do more than just calculating the, the exact pixel I'm clicking on relative to the, the client or the canvas. I want to strip off that border and now only focus on if my click occurs within that game board that I have defined. So that's what the rest of this code is going to be doing here. Here, when I take the, the floor for my X and my Y, I am, this is where I'm taking the pixel calculation, which is the pixel coordinate, and translating it into a square coordinate. It's telling me which square, or technically in the game of Go, which intersection I am on, which one I'm hovering over. This will now give me a number that is an integer number, more like an index into an array. That's what you would expect when you're dealing with uh, discrete squares or discrete cells in your game world. And you might have that, so you might want to include this type of uh, truncating with the floor function to get yourself these nice integers. Now I've added one extra line of error checking here, which is to make sure that the number that I'm getting is within the boundaries that I expect for my game board, which is zero to 18. As I mentioned, it's a 19 by 19 game board. So this is just to make sure I just had a little bit of, you know, I, I guess I could call them bugs or features uh, when I didn't have this line in there, which is my mouse shadow, which would hover over a, a stone, would hover it outside of the game board surface as well, which looked a little bit bizarre. Uh, the game logic I had built in wouldn't let me click there anyways, but you know, it's the little things like this that maybe uh, are, are nice finishing touches on your game. So I put this in to make sure that I'm not getting a mouse shadow outside of the game board playable area, only when it's playable. And then I just return only the X and Y. So what's actually being stored here, the that.click and the that.mouse, is just the X and Y. Okay, now the other thing I, I sort of Focus on as though this were a click, but the exact same thing is going to happen if the mouse moves. I'm going to take that event whenever the mouse moves, the mouse move event is triggered. If the mouse is just sitting there by itself, this won't be triggered, but if it moves, it will. And whenever it moves, if it moves to whatever location it will, it will be, we will strip out that X and Y and I will store that X and Y inside my mouse. And again, this function get X and Y will We'll strip it out and translate it into my game world coordinates. My game world coordinates for the game board is just the indexes 0 to 18 uh, where on the game board I am. So the last piece of our puzzle is how do we respond to this mouse input? And so in this particular game, the way I respond is, well, there is some response to clicks, which will be placing stones on the board. That logic I'm not going to show, but instead I'm going to show here the logic of how I draw that mouse cursor as it floats above the game board. So to do that, you can see that I'm using the game.mouse. That was the value that we, we saved whenever the mouse moved. I've stored it in the game engine, and here I'm, I'm checking on it. I'm checking to see if it's actually there. What that means is if the mouse has moved, then this will be defined as above when we check that it'll be, it'll have the get X and Y, the X, Y coordinates stored in it. And if the game, if the mouse has not moved, then this will not be defined and we won't do anything here. Now, the way I've actually got it set up in my game engine is that if the mouse moves, then we will store its last location that it has moved to. And if it doesn't move, we just 
still keep that last stored location. And so my mouse shadow will continue to follow my mouse cursor even when the mouse cursor is not moving, it will just stay in the last position that it was. If the mouse cursor is defined, then what we do is we just use the X and Y, as you can see here, directly as indexes into my game board array, as you might expect. So that game board array is what I use in the game logic to keep track of where a black stone or a white stone has been placed. And this is just checking here to see if that if that location is set to zero, that means it's empty, then that means we could draw the shadow over that location. This is a place where we could place a stone, and so I will draw the shadow. And so I've got a little bit of logic here to draw the shadow. I've got this black and white stone images, and you can see here that the mouse X and the mouse Y are the indexes that I'm using to calculate where I should draw that shadow. In the same way, if we wanted to detect a click to say where we might want to put a stone, in, in my game logic, that means changing one of these zeros to a one or a two, then we would use the exact same logic here, except we would use this.game.click.xny as indexes into our board array in the same way. All right, so in this video, I showed you how we can capture a click or a mouse move event uh, in our canvas and then respond to that by drawing something on our canvas, maybe in this case, a mouse shadow or cursor that follows our mouse around. All right, thanks a lot for watching and we'll see you in that next video.